Yeah, I, I wanted to highlight uh, this different worldview uh, that we're talking about. So, you know, for ages, we've had this way of thinking in terms of relationships, not only personal, interpersonal, or social relationships, but uh, relational worldview has always been a very fundamental way of how we grasp the world, you know, me or myself in, in relation to something, right? So that kind of, those kinds of thinking or worldviews show up in, uh, uh, in these drawings and, uh, you know, family, for example, family trees of the nobles uh, in Europe. And uh, 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 I think this is like saints or kinship and, and marriage uh, relationships kind of drawn as a sort of a, a tree. Uh, and you have the nodes here. So simple structure because it, it you know, shows the genealogy. You don't see uh, loops, for example, in, in this kind of picture, right? Uh, but uh, it was, it has always been a, a fundamental way how we organize uh, our thoughts and information, okay? Uh, all the way up to something like this, uh, X-Men family tree. Uh, there are all sorts of ties here, very different from, uh, you know, the genealogical tree that uh, we saw before. So there it's mostly uh, a family uh, or kin relationships. Here, uh, you can represent the relationships with many different kinds of ties. So there's like romantic relationships, genetic, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, uh, antagonism, I think. Uh, so it's kind of interesting to, to see different relationships or, uh, represented as ties, but it's hard to make a, you know make anything of it, uh, which is why we have uh, more formal methods to uh, you know, organize or, or uh, summarize uh, the structure of, of these networks. Here's another uh, way of representing collaborations and open source software uh, communities. Uh, this is, a, you know, a drawing by Charles Darwin, uh, showing his idea of you know, a common origin uh, in you know the development and uh, the you know development of of life and, and species branching out. So, So in the social sciences, uh, we talk about social networks, people's relationships with one another. And it has been primarily used as a tool rather than a theory. It's a method uh, or a set of methods uh, for understanding how we as a society, as a collective uh, can thrive or even exist or coexist, right? Uh, think about or assume that everybody's egoistic and selfish, uh, social order is just not possible, right? Uh, we're going to screw each other over and uh, it's just a you know, war of all against all. Uh, so that was the question that a lot of social theorists back in the 19th century had when there was the you know, uh, industrial revolution, uh, you know, production relations uh, were drastically changing um, and you started to see laborers and you know, capitalists and so on. So with this drastic change, there was a lot of uh, uncertainty and uh, seeming disorder. Um, and so the, the intellectuals of the time were asking how, how, how can we restore order? Um, so that was a sort of big question that they had at the time. It was kind of the mantra. Um, so one of the uh, founding fathers of sociology, Georg uh, Simmel, he, uh, he was particularly influential in the development of uh, social networks and the idea of uh, you know, relationships kind of forming the uh, basis of the society. So he sort of understood, he uh, thought that when we talk about social order or think about uh, how order is possible, we can't really reduce 
individuals or individual psychology. It has some notion of relations or ties. Okay. Um, and he also posited that uh, order emerges from uh, these patterned, uh, repeated or patterned interactions. Um, I'm going to skip this. This was the, the very early uh, sort of social network uh, diagrams that uh, Jacob Moreno and uh, Helen Jennings uh, produced. Um, so it's a classroom, you know, students, and there are triangles and uh, uh, circles, and the lines here are friendships. Can you, anybody tell me what the triangles and circles represent? These are school, you know, classroom, like grade school kids. I was going to say, are these like, is this racial segregation? Could be, could be. It's a good guess. Any any other guess? Yeah. Yeah, it's gender. This is like you know fourth grade uh, school kids, and uh, you know there's no cross gender friendships at, at that age, I guess. Or maybe it was more particular to to the that time. Um, but you you have this one lone bridge <laughs> uh, that's keeping the the whole network intact. Okay, so these diagrams or these network um, visualizations were actually pretty instrumental uh, in the development of social network analysis uh, because it, it gave you a very powerful uh, tool to visualize structure um, and kind of gain intuition from, uh, from the visualizations themselves. Um, and later on, these, these you know, graphical approaches were combined with more mathematical uh, and rigorous uh, graph theoretic uh, approaches. Okay, um, so we were talking about ties, you know, relational worldview. That also means that you see uh, people's relationships as interdependent. You don't have individual atoms in society, right? Everybody's sort of interdependent on everybody else one way or another. So uh, this approach kind of emphasizes the interdependence of, of individuals um, and, you know, it, it actually turns out to be a very important uh, notion, methodologically speaking. So, uh, in the, the empirical methods, this course, did you already cover, like, uh, regression methods and things like that? Yeah, so even regression, the underlying assumption for that method to work is uh, independence assumption, right? Your uh, cases or... Your, your error terms should not be uh, correlated, meaning that uh, there's no sort of social influence or interdependence between uh, the cases or individuals that you observe. Um, and only with that kind of uh, fundamental uh, assumption can you, you know, draw uh, sound conclusions from, from the analysis. Uh, well, if you take this relational view, that, you, you know, that assumption just gets thrown out the window because um, everybody's influencing everybody else. Even if you can sample, uh, get a random sample of a population uh, and you're sort of thinking or you're assuming that those who were sampled are not connected to one another uh, and therefore you know, the independence assumption is not violated, uh, but really that's not the case. There, there are you know, so many different ways uh, that people influence one another uh, through different routes, and it can uh, lead to, uh, it, it basically violates the independence assumption. Um, now, one way to think about social network analysis uh, is to kind of contrast it with uh, the network science, uh, you know, developed from the physical sciences or natural sciences so one commonality is that both uh, make heavy use of uh, graph theory, uh, and those are the, they're like common tools uh, which are really powerful uh, 
they can be uh, um, uh, applied to to different contexts. Uh, so that's one commonality. And there's also you know similar theoretical interests, uh, but using you know different terminology. So uh, for the social network analysts, uh, social inequalities, uh, for example, you know uh, wage inequality or um, relationship inequality. These inequalities are uh, one of the key uh, uh, keywords in, in research. Uh, and although the network scientists from the uh, natural sciences may not uh, use those terms like social capital or uh, social inequality, uh, they'll often talk about degree distributions. Um, and we'll, we'll talk more about that in the, uh, later on. Uh, but if you think about degree distributions and the sort of skewed uh, distribution that you all often observe in, in networks um, across you know different uh, fields, uh, that essentially is also about inequality. Some people or some uh, brain cells are just you know better connected and have more connections than others. Okay, so uh, that's one one common theoretical interest. Um, and then, how do we think about social groups or, or you know, groups of nodes uh, is another common interest between these two different traditions. Um, so when we talk about social groups, like you know, S3D, for example, uh, we, we have a really clear boundary between inside the group versus outside, right? But when you only have nodes and, and edges, can you sort of uh, use the data to infer uh, those boundaries? Right? So uh, there's this tradition of talking about uh, uh, methods to extract uh, tightly knit subgroups, social groups in, in social network analysis. And um, similarly in the natural sciences and network science, uh, this kind of idea is couched in, in terms of uh, modular commu communities, community detection. Okay. Uh, finally, there's also uh, this notion of how strong or durable the network is. In, in other words, if you start you know, chopping off the links that are you know, formed here, or if you start removing uh, nodes in the network, uh, how far do you need to go before uh, the overall network that used to be intact Know, unravels or splits apart, right? Uh, so that has, you know, that idea or that notion has obvious implications for for uh, social processes, like you know, a, a group kind of uh, splitting into two versus uh, having you know solidarity and uh, being able to achieve, uh, you know, uh, or, or tackle really large collective action problems if you can maintain that you know large subgroup. Um, so. That's on the SNA side. On the uh, network science side, it's, it's couched in terms of network robustness. Um, so if you can think of, of like uh, the power grid, right? Um, there are cascading you know, failures in the, in the power grid. So how do you kind of prevent that from happening? Um, so if, even if you have a little failure in this geographic region, how do you kind of contain that so that the entire network doesn't uh, fall apart? Uh, so the, the tools and methods that are, are used in these two traditions are somewhat dim, um, dissimilar, but uh, they still kind of share these common theoretical interests. It, it just requires a little bit of translation you know, between the two. Um, okay. We still don't have 30, okay. Um, the more fundamental distinction between social network analysis and uh, uh, network science is, I guess, in what you're trying to achieve or what you're trying to learn. So in the case of network science, it's all, uh, often about commonalities, universal laws. Can you find some universal law that governs, you know, disparate uh, types of uh, networks from, from the bio, uh, 
from biological networks all the way to social and even mechanical networks. Um, on the other hand, social network analysis is because of the interest in uh, intentionality of humans, the social context in which relationships form and uh, interactions occur, uh, th there's more interest in, in variation rather than commonalities. Um, they're like two sides of the same coin, but just the, you know, the emphasis is a little bit different. So Albert Laszlo Barabasi, uh, the, the author of the, the you know, textbook that you read, Network Science, um, you know, he, he is a really strong believer of, uh, because he, he's a, a trained physicist, he, uh, his, his mission is sort of trying to uh, find an a organizing, organizing principle that can apply, be applied to uh, many different networks. Uh, Linton Friedman, who was a social network analyst, one of the uh, uh, beginning, uh, in the, in, very influential in the early uh, stages of the field, um, he was always thinking about how you can you uncover uh, various kinds of patterns depending on the social context at hand. Right. So uh, these two quotes kind of exemplify that difference in orientation. Uh, and I don't think this is in the, the comparison or contrast between social network analysis and machine learning. It wasn't in the reading, but uh, I thought it would be of interest to, to many of you here. Um, so machine learning, what, what's the, the ultimate goal? It's, it's to predict, right? It's trying to make, a model is trying to make a prediction as accurately and precisely as possible. Uh, so, it, the questions that arise are typically, you know, uh, if it's about predicting the network, then how accurately can you predict uh, the presence of a tie in this network? Uh, or, you know, how can you uh, leverage network information um, to do downstream you know, prediction tasks? Uh, so, uh, graph neural network uh, approaches are you know, in that, uh, falls into that bucket. Um, so prediction is kind of primary, it's, it's when uh, approaches using networks. Uh, in social network analysis, it's less about prediction and more about explanation. Right? After all, it's a social science. Uh, the science is all about, you know, understanding and, and explaining, right? So uh, there is a, a slight difference and you, you can kind of represent these differences uh, as beta hats versus uh, y hats. So uh, beta hat is the, the parameter estimate, right? You, um, you're, you're trying to establish the relationship between you know, two variables uh, with that parameter, um, and it kind of represents the, uh, the explanation. Whereas uh, if you're really you know, emphasizing y hat, that's uh, the predicted value, right? Um, which is kind of, what, what is of interest for, for machine learning. Uh, any questions here? No? Okay. Uh, so, you know, uh, with machine learning models, you, uh, you get accurate predictions, but it's a, basically a black box. You don't know what's going on, how you got those predictions. Uh, on the other hand, social network analysis or, or models from SNA uh, it, it's, it kind of prioritizes interpretability, uh, simpler models. Uh, you will never see <laughs> like a exponential random graph model uh, that has like millions of, of parameters. Right? That just doesn't, yeah, it's not possible. Um, so for the sake of you know, discussion, I made this uh, distinction between beta hat and y hat. Uh, explanation versus prediction, uh, but certainly there's this you know movement towards convergence from from the two uh, uh, camps. So you know on the machine learning side, you know, because of uh, you know ethical uh, concerns and uh, 
uh, biases that affect so many people. Um, so there's a movement towards trying to understand uh, how these predictions are, were made, right? That's just a general kind of uh, movement towards explainability, uh, which is the, the primary interest of uh, social network analysis. Um, on the other hand, social network analysis is, uh, is starting to appreciate more the importance of predictions. So uh, if you're explaining something, then you ought to be able to predict. Right. If your model uh, gives you a very clean interpretation or explanation about a social phenomena, and yet those assumptions, uh, when they're translated into a model and you know, try to kind of predict uh, and it fails, then you know, almost by definition, you haven't explained it. Okay. Uh, so th there's that kind of awareness uh, developing uh, more recently. I just want to emphasize one more time. Uh, it, it's really important to to know your data, know your context of study. What are the nodes? Um, and there can be more than one type of node in, in a network. Uh, and what's the nature of the tie? How? Uh, what what do these um, connections in your data represent? What, what do they really represent? And what's the sort of uh, processes that underlie uh, those formations. Um, and then how does the system uh, as a whole kind of self-organize to, to produce order? So in other words, how, how do you measure and interpret uh, the underlying structure of networks? Okay. Uh, and because of this emphasis on, on the social context uh, and meaning, um, uh, there are many different types of uh, social ties. Uh, you can have ties that are based on uh, similarity. Right? Uh, if you're you know, in the same location geographically, then that could represent a tie. Um, if you go to the same uh, club or if you're affiliated to the same set of groups uh, on campus, for example, uh, then you have these affiliation uh, connections based on membership. Uh, also, like gender and income, all these demographic variables can be used to uh, think about uh, connections as well. Maybe not direct interactions, uh, but some, some notion of similarity uh, that can be expressed as, as a tie. And then we have social relations like kinship and um, um, affection uh, and, and uh, cognition, like who knows whom, things like that. Um, and then actual interactions from sexual uh, contacts to advice giving and uh, just friendship uh, and so on. So uh, there's the, and depending on how you define your tie, uh, the structure uh, that you get from uh, the same kind of method or tool that you apply, the meaning can be you know, drastically different. So it's kind of important to, to know your context. So imagine you have, on the one hand, you have a friendship network, right? And you find this closed triad. So you, know, you have three friends who are all connected to each other, right? What does that mean? It means you, know, you, you have a really strong, tightly knit uh, group of friends, of three. Now imagine that the, the tie is adversarial, right? Or, or hate. And you, again, find this triangle, like three people who all hate one another. What does that mean? Uh, right, I, I'm not like asking for, for an answer, but just to think about uh, what that, what those, you know, the same structure, uh, but the meaning it has to be different. Um, and the probability of observing them should also be different because of the differences in, in ties. Um, I don't know if you've heard of balance theory, uh, structural balance. Basically, the friend of your friend is your friend. The enemy of your friend is your enemy. Uh, what, what else? The enemy of your enemy is your friend, and so on, right? 
So you can have these uh, even number of negative pi's in, in a triangle uh, that, that, that you know, creates balance, right? It makes, it makes sense. Um, but it doesn't quite make a lot of sense to have three people who are all antagonistic to one another, right? Negative pi's, all negative pi's um, in this closed triangle. Uh, uh, so, you know, depending on the, the content of the pi, these uh, interpretations need to change. Uh, and one way to think about uh, social order or the, the context in which uh, the networks that you observe uh, are operating, um, you know, you can have the same kind of structure when you draw draw the diagram out, uh, but one could be about the pecking order among chickens, uh, which is governed by a very different uh, dynamic than uh, these monkeys that are grooming one another. So both of them are dominance orders, but uh, the sort of structure that uh, you observe in these uh, two different species, uh, pies that represent uh, dominance or hierarchy can, can be different. doing on time here. Um, do I show it again? No? Okay. I think I'll stop here and then maybe we can um, move on to the third uh, presentation. I'm doing it. Okay. Uh, do you, you could do you want to share your screen or yeah, it's okay. yeah. Oh, oh you, you need to uh, stop sharing. Oh, oh sorry. Maybe. Thanks. Do I need to stop here or I could stop here? Whatever you like. I, I mean, can people on Zoom hear me? Uh, yeah, we can hear you. Just keep speaking loudly. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. I, I'll just stop here. Yeah, so uh, this is actually uh, uh, like about the chapters of the book. So it's there's no like central topic. I mean, there's one, it's all about network science, but it's quite sparse and it's not like a paper. So, uh, and actually lots of topics are covered by uh, Patrick already. And so what is network science? Uh, it's an interdisciplinary science used to understand complex systems. So the uh, high level idea of uh, network science is that uh, we can model a uh, network as a graph and so that we can apply uh, existing mathematical models to understand the, the, the network. So the, the problem of understanding a network is that it's a very complex system without the abstraction and if you just uh, try to interpret uh, the behavior of the network itself, it's actually quite challenging. And uh, the, the science is uh, rooted in graph theory and social science, and it's always used empirical uh, methods, uh, and, and it has lots of impacts, uh, economic, health, and security. Uh, for example, the, for the economic, you can understand the like the, the Facebook or the uh, Twitter like follower uh, subscriber graphs and to provide uh, customized ads to them and for the health I, I think you can understand people from uh, different location from different time to provide a uh, better uh, treatment for them and security, uh, I forgot. 
Yeah, uh, I, I think it's related to uh, like how you understand the like the the network of people to identify potential threats. Sorry, I, I forgot the, the example. But so the entire network uh, science is based on graph theory, and which is a powerful tool to understand the network. And it makes a problem simpler and trackable with uh, powerful math tools, as uh, we just saw. And basically, all networks are graphs. And to give you an example, this, uh, I'm not sure if you can read that clearly, but here we can have internet uh, itself is a graph where you have the network devices as nodes and also uh, there are also links. Uh, uh, different network devices can communicate with each other and there are direct links and uh, indirect links. And there are also uh, the, the web pages. Uh, each web page with an URL is a node. And if a web page points to the other one and it, there is a link between two web pages. And there are also power grid uh, mobile phone calls, etc. So I don't think I covered that, but uh, in the network, there are actually uh, two basic components. You have nodes, you have links, and there are also uh, certain properties. You can have degrees of the nodes where uh, a node can have, uh, degree means the number of links uh, of a given node, and you can have a very dense graph where, where uh, a node points to all other nodes. Uh, this, uh, and the density of the node can be represented by the average degree of the graph. So uh, you, you can have different representation of the graph. You can have the, uh, just the graphical representation. You can also, have this mathematical representation using agency matrix. And uh, so different representation give you uh, different information. For example, if you use the agency uh, matrix, it's easier for you to get the uh, degrees of the nodes. And if you uh, just visualize the graph itself, uh, it's e easier for you to observe uh, properties by looking at the graph. So, and there are different types of uh, graphs. For example, this is bipartite uh, network where you can clearly see two different groups of nodes and there's no links uh, inside the, each group of nodes and there's only links between uh, different groups of nodes. And there are also properties of the uh, graph where uh, you can have the shortest path of a graph. Uh, you can have shortest path uh, between nodes. And there's also a network diameter, which, uh, which is the longest shortest path in your graph. And it, there's also average path length and clustering coefficient. So, all of those concepts are related to the graph theory itself, but uh, those uh, concepts can be used for you to understand the network. And so shall I stop or shall I continue? Because uh, those are like different captures. Yeah. Um I just want to add some things. Uh, so there are different measures uh, for a network, right? You have uh, path length, which is the shortest path between any two you know, nodes in the network. Uh, characteristic path length is simply the average of all the uh, pairs of nodes. Um, and you know, the, the path length, of, you, you probably already know this, but um, it is important in many different applications from uh, you know, searching, uh, conducting searches on the network uh, to 
modeling uh, the speed of contagion, for example, how, how quickly something spreads uh, you know, on, on these networks, uh, and uh, clustering, uh, for example, is the, the, the extent to which uh, people are all tied to one another in a, in a tightly knit fashion. So uh, with the proportion of uh, closed triangles um, relative to the possible uh, open triangles that exist. Um, and yeah, so I think it would... Yeah, uh, so, yeah, uh, thanks. So, so my point is, um, sorry. <laughs> no worries. My, my point is, um, you know, these measures have, have uh, different applications and meanings um, across, you know, different sub-disciplines uh, that use network methods. Yeah, I, I think one example uh, mentioned in the book is that uh, I, I think most people have already know that uh, if you want to, uh, if you know someone and that knows someone that knows someone, and if you reach, uh, want to reach some f famous people, the shortest path is only like six. So uh, you can basically use that, uh, that concept to confirm your uh, theory. So, yeah, so, and there's something called random network. Uh, basically, it's a mathematical tool for you to simulate uh, a net network where uh, the real data is not available. So, uh, it defined as you can have uh, n label nodes that are connected with L randomly uh, placed links and each pair of unlabeled nodes is connected with probability p. So, uh, and there are two, oh sorry, there's one property of the, the random network, uh, which is the degree distribution. Uh, remember that the degree is the number of links that a node has. Uh, it's uh, by nominal distribution, but, <laughs> Real networks are uh, not poison. So basically, uh, if you look at the, yes. So here you can have the, those are three different data sets. The, the first one is the internet, the, the link. And the second one is the science collaboration. And third one is protein, protein uh, interactions and uh, if you use a random network to model uh, those three networks and you also use uh, plot the real data, you, you will see that uh, they have very different shapes and uh, which basically tries to say that the, the real network is actually very different from the random network. And I, I got confused here while reading the capture chapter because I wasn't really sure why random network is still useful if it's not, I mean, if it's different from the real network. So, uh, so you why, why you have an entire chapter on random networks, yes, right? I, I, I think uh, the book tries to mention because it's still a powerful math, mathematical tool uh, for you to do modeling and you can, uh, you analyze it mathematically, but uh, yeah, I still wasn't sure. Any thoughts, ideas? Maybe it really comes down to, um, sorry. I, I was just gonna say, maybe it just provides like a baseline of randomness. <laughs> Yeah, you, you know, when you're looking at, uh, for example, characteristic path length, like if the average path length is six in a, in a given network, how do you know if that's long or short, right? You, you need some baseline or benchmark. And um, because we know uh, the, the mathematics, the, the properties of uh, random graphs um, in, in, you know, in detail, um, it becomes a, a nice natural uh, uh, baseline 
to compare your empirical networks against. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so yeah, that's uh, for the random network. And here is the last topic. It's called the power loss and scale-free networks. Basically, uh, as we discussed, the random network cannot model uh, the real network. And then how, what kind of math tool, mathematical tool we can use to understand them. So uh, one nice property observed by the researchers is that uh, here is an example, the degree distribution of the, this is the web page uh, data set, is well approximated with uh, PK uh, with respect to the K, uh, to the power of gamma, where gamma is the, basically the slope of the, uh, if you have this log log scale, uh, and a scale-free network is a network whose degree distribution follow this power law. So basically, uh, if you have this uh, log and log uh, relationship between the, the degree of the each node and also the probability or, or the density of or sorry, distribution of the, the degree, uh, then this is, uh, uh, they say that this network follows the power law. And yeah, I, I think that's it. And <laughs> so there, there are some ideas. So I, I, I like for, for the, the I, I, I think there are more network these days and from the soft, software engineer research perspective, I, I do see more and more uh, networks showing up. Uh, for example, from the open source community, we can see those uh, dense package dependencies between different applications and libraries, and there are also microservices. If you follow the chaotic Twitter thing these days, and Twitter is trying to remove the, the microservices dependencies internally, and we will see how it goes. But uh, yeah, I, I, I do see there are more and more microservices. Yeah, that's. Thank you. Uh, so, since we have a lot of software engineers <laughs> here, um, what's what's some questions or, or problems that um, you think the, these you know network representations uh, of you know um, package dependencies can can solve? Is there something that's puzzling about? You know, empirically speaking. Uh, I, I think one I've been thinking is similar to the grid uh, mentioned by the book at the very beginning. Is, it, is there a very critical package that is depended widely by all other applications? So if that packet fails, that will cause a very severe uh, impact to the entire open source community. Or what makes worse is that if the, the packet itself is evil, what kind of damage can the, the packet do? What does that mean? Or like, I mean, if I inject some malicious code to the log4j, which is the like most popular logging framework that is used by almost every single Java application. So I'm basically controlling the entire world. Or if you steal the credentials of the people who run the open source project, you can also get cheese codes. Uh, and if um, the, the more central that the, the package is in this dependency network, uh, the larger the, the they get. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, one time when I was doing an empirical study, at the end of it, 
um, we were like, oh, this ecosystem is like an onion, and a network scientist could do something about this, but we're too lazy because we're already about to finish this project and we're all sick of it. But basically, <laughs> we were realizing that like this ecosystem was very new, and so a lot of people were directly depending on the core packages. But you could argue that as an ecosystem becomes more developed, people will not have direct dependencies on like the core modules because other people will build things on top of them so they'll have indirect dependencies on them. So we're like, oh, you could probably see like how, you know, how good from like the perspective of abstractions and how developed an ecosystem is by like trying to quantify those layers, but I'm never gonna do it, but some, someone so that, in terms of network imagery, if you can draw out that, that kind of structure, would it kind of look like you have this central package that is like connected? Like a lot of different like projects and packages are. are um, yeah, like the Python core or something. Python like core. Um, actually, there's more, but there's not that many. There's just a small, small group. And then, yeah, and then there's like another layer around that. Right. That are kind of almost standard library, but not quite. And then as you keep going out, you get to like more and more obscure applications that like one person built and nobody else will ever use. But the depth, right? Like in the ecosystem we were studying, it was kind of a dumpster fire. So everybody was directly depending on the core modules. Uh -huh. Whereas like you would hope that if people were really building applications right you wouldn't still have to depend on like the first directly at least depend on like the first three libraries added so yeah you'd want like you could do like you know like the earth's crust kind of uh -huh. like that but um yeah so are, are, is it fair to say uh, based on what you said yeah um if you see these um connections between the the peripheral nodes, the, the more you observe these frequently, the more mature the project is? I would, yeah, I would, or that's an interest. I was thinking it like, um, basically you would hope, I guess that it would be kind of almost like distinct layers, like. Oh, okay. But I think that too would be probably a sign of maturity. Basically anything is, probably better than a system where everybody's depending on like 10 standard library packages and then nothing else because that's what we were finding like there was no relationship to like the one we just drew it was all just you know nobody wanted to rely on the code that was being built by most people but they would rely on like the really old standard like 20 things that were in there mm -hmm. um, so it wasn't really maturing outward I think something like Python, you know, has is a lot better. Like there are packages that aren't standard library, but they seem like they are because people just did a good job writing them that way. Um, nice. Do you say it's bad if people aren't using the newer packages because it means that people are like reduplicating work, probably? Or yeah, or they or they don't trust the other code that's being added. Ah. Like not. Social term. <laughs> trust. Trust. Okay, so trust could be an issue. So everybody's like, there, there's more assurance um, connecting or just you know uh, limiting your dependencies to to uh, the well connected central nodes. Right. So the if you kind of <laughs> this is funny out of context. So it, it this would. Of have this um, star network imagery, like every but every new package uh, or project that's being developed will just connect to the center. Now this is an exaggeration, but at the extreme, you're going to get just kind of a star network where um, the degree of the central node is like orders of magnitude larger uh, than the rest. So in that case, you would get something like a power law degree distribution, right? You have, um, this is the you know, probability 
Uh, here's the degree. Um, and it kind of looks like this. Right? We have the vast majority of packages, right, with very low degree, no, no incoming you know, dependencies. Um, and you have a very few packages that have extremely high degree. Now, when you, you know, take this, the axes and you know, log transform them on a log log scale, it would look like a straight line. Log degree, log. Right, so, and then, you know, the, the straight line, uh, the, the slope of the, the straight line is the gamma, uh, gamma value. And um, you know, the, the steeper the, the slope, now let me ask you that. If, if you have one system where uh, you have the slope like this, and then another system where the degree distribution um, has a slope not as steep, so let's say this is gamma equals uh, 2.2, and this is 2.5. So this is steeper. Which one is um, more unequal in terms of the share of uh, uh, share of connections? The steeper one. The steeper one. I mean, so thinking through this out loud, I guess, a little bit, um, it, the less steep one means that you have less, the area under the like logarithmic curve is more distributed over on the graph. So you have more evenly distributed degrees of freedom. So you can think of this in, in you know, two ways. If we focus, let, let's call this you know, inequality, right? The vast majority of people have very few ties, right? That, that's here. You're looking at the lower ends. So it, if you compare the lower ends, which one is more unequal? Like the, the more, uh, higher the frequency of the lower end, like uh, you know, higher you go, that means uh, the proportion of people who have low degree uh, is higher. So in that sense, it, you know, you, you could argue that's uh, unequal, more unequal. But if you go out to the uh, the uh, the right side, the end, um, what you're seeing here is that you see a higher proportion of people with this degree. In uh, in this this um, less steep slope compared to the steeper one, which means that uh, people here there, there are more people who have extremely um, high degree. So in that sense, there's you know higher inequality in in the blue one in the blue line. So I don't know what is uh, what is better for for for, for this for particular systems, like, you know, we were talking about package dependencies. Um, presumably, if you have something like this blue line, uh, it's more centralized. So there could be, uh, it, it could be um, more efficient in terms of, uh, you know, maintaining the system. All you have to do is really, uh, you know, take good care and, and put a lot of uh, resources into maintaining the central package. Uh, but that has, you know, it, it increases the uh, failure. Uh, the, the magnitude of the failure will be much larger in that kind of a system. If, you know, that, that node fails, then um, it's going to take down a lot of other packages that depend on it. So, okay, um, any other thoughts? But thank you. For that. that was an interesting. Uh, yeah. So I'm just wondering, like, with all of those things, I don't know how many possible domain it is because 
I think it's kind of expected at this point in an open source ecosystem that you are going to have like pretty extreme power laws going on. But like, I never really felt like I was able to capture, I don't know, like, uh, in this particular ecosystem, there was like an aggressively even worse problem of like people not really using the ecosystem other than to standardize it. Whereas like, again, like something like Python, that's not true. So I don't like, how would you capture sort of like the layers, like the average distance to the center or something like that? Or like, I don't know, I guess that's sort of what I, so uh, I, can I like reframe your your um, yeah, your sure. thought your question? Please. Is it fair to say or ask? Um, how do you get a more decentralized network where uh, there's more connections between the you know peripheral nodes? Can I just sure? Yeah, thank you. Oh, I I mean like that if people are building abstractions, you don't have to necessarily rely on the inner thing directly anymore so like if you have let's say this is the standard library and there's like a bunch of little nodes in here that may or may not rely on each other and then you have like semi-standard library that relies on them mm -hmm. and then this is like another layer and then you have so that uh, second layer is uh defined in relation to the center yeah. How like, many hops do you have to go out to? Yeah, exactly. Okay. And then okay. you have like, you could say, I mean, there could be, I don't know exactly what this would look like, but just, yeah, basically the distance from the center, like if you see these layers forming, that means people are, right? Like if, I don't know, like 10 years goes by and nobody's like going to use this file that converts I don't know, does addition in Python, let's just say. So everybody, like they built like a math library on top of it. So now when people make packages, they rely on the math library, but not the add anymore. Mm -hmm. Like that's kind of what I was, this to me, like kind of layering is a sign of maturity. But what we had was like this and then everybody doing this and nobody like relying on, you know, their people at the same layer as them. So it was like a very, very, very centralized graph whereas I think I don't know maybe there are things that we can propose hmm. to run into that. Yeah. So and uh one one reason that you hypothesize was trust. There's less trust for those in the periphery. Yeah and just the quality of the of the code is very bad. It's also this was a robotics like ecosystem. Oh you know Ross, yeah. Like it, so it was super hacky and you know they are dealing with complicated i guess middleware which can be maybe it's hard to make it reusable in the first place but there was a whole ecosystem of packages and pretty much everybody just used the standard library and like didn't care about the rest of the ecosystem i don't know how much it's changed are you still building your own stuff it's still the same it's still, it's still like that okay <laughs> So, uh, the, the, you know, these are interesting thoughts. Uh, how do you then make it more healthy or more robust, I guess, uh, and more efficient as well in, in that, uh, you know, you're not essentially reinventing the wheel, right? Uh, th those are all, I think, related to, to you know, practices and, uh, you know, the sort of trust that that you can build on in, in these open source software uh, you know communities, and so it all kind of ties back into you know social relationships. How, how do you strengthen the, the social aspect uh, of these collaborative communities? Um, but yeah, interesting. Um, we're out of time. Um, so I wanted to, oh, there's a question in the chat. Is the random model the normal? Yes, random model is the normal in many cases. Um, and you can also have conditionally random uh, models where uh, you fix the average number, uh, average degree, for example, 
Um, and other than that uh, constrained aspect, everything else is uh, random. So there can be many different flavors of randomness, random memory. Okay, um, I can talk about the visualization a little bit next time and um, before we get into the, uh, the other readings. Um, Charity, I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, I didn't mean to like leave you out, but um, maybe you could give a brief, uh, brief uh, discussion or presentation uh, on Thursday.